Hello. Today I would like to present our work uh, understanding the origins of uh, ancient Ashkenaz and the Yiddish language. Uh, this work uh, was done in collaboration with Paul Wexler and other colleagues. The purpose of this work uh, was to understand the uh, geographical origins of, uh, of the Yiddish language. It's one of the last European languages whose linguistic and geographical classification remain unclear even after 300 years of research. Um, Yiddish is the native language of Ashkenazic Jews, um, whose own origin remain uh, debatable, um, which uh, gave us hope that if we can localize uh, that language, we can also localize the origin of Ashkenazic Jews. Um, assuming that uh, the history of these two is parallel, as Weinrich noted, at least in part, um, that uh, would be able to, uh, um, uh, th th this would work. Um, another question we were hoping to answer is where is Ashkenaz? Ashkenaz, um, as you know, is one of the most disputed uh, biblical um, place names. It is mentioned um, few, only a few times, twice uh, in the context of Noah's uh, descendants and once in reference to uh, some legendary kingdom that would wage war on Babylon um, at the end of the days. Um, this is the first study that analyzed the genetic data of Yiddish speakers, so of course Ashkenazic Jews, but specifically Yiddish speakers, um, and it is carried out at a time where there are fewer and fewer people who speak uh, solely Yiddish, um, willing to uh, participate in such study. Um, our uh, rationale was that uh, there is a very well-established relationships between genetics, geography, and language. Um, genetics uh, are, can be translated to geographical regions using a tool that we developed called Geographic Population Structure, or GPS. Um, and again, the relationships between language and geography have been studied uh, very, very well. Um, altogether, if we considered all these three, um, we should be able to answer the question who are um, Ashkenazic Jews, where, where are they from, and where uh, Yiddish has uh, originated. Um, of course, there is a lot of interest in answering those questions, and as you can see in this, this figure that I grabbed from the internet, I, I don't know how reliable it is. It simply uh, shows there is a lot of interest in mapping um, uh, place names from the Bible to an actual locations, and if you look close enough, you can see that only Ashkenaz is mentioned twice, uh, because there's never been any certainty as to as to where it is. Okay, this is based on the um, uh, 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 names mentioned in uh, in Genesis 10. Um, we uh, followed uh, two hypotheses in this work, comparing two possible scenarios. The first, the left one in blue, is called the Rhineland hypothesis. This hypothesis um, presumes that at some point the Judeans were exiled to Rome in the year of 70. This, of course, event that uh, has never happened. Uh, Shlomo Sand discussed that at length in his book, The Invention of the Jewish uh, People. Um, but um, let's moving on from this. Um, after their arrival in Rome at some point, they uh, presumably uh, were released from captivity, uh, migrated into uh, uh, Franconia, um, and then to the Rhineland, where they adopted some German dialect, and it turned out into uh, Yiddish. And uh, in the mid-13th century, uh, mass migration to Eastern Europe, um, and uh, and at that point, they experienced a demographic miracle uh, that um, created a very large uh, Jewish community. Uh, needless to say, uh, this miracle event, um, I don't need to mention that it is disputed. It is sufficient to say that um, it should not be considered science. Um, however, you'd be surprised how many people um, write that in their papers as if this is a, a reasonable and viable explanation. Uh, the reason it is called demographic miracle is because the uh, it requires us to assume that Ashkenazic Jews reproduced at a, uh, experienced a baby boom 
uh, on uh, expansion rates for 500 years um, at a time where uh, some of European nations have been uh, contracted because of the Black Death and, and so forth. Um, that growth rate is, unima uh, is unimaginable and, and it cannot be generated um, through normal reproduction rates, hence the, the demographic miracle. Uh, the alternative hypothesis is called the um, the uh, uh, Slavo uh, Irano Turkish hypothesis uh, suggests that um, at, at some point Iranian uh, Jewry became very well developed, um, initially founded uh, by uh, travelers, uh, supplemented by exiles uh, from from Israel in in Judea. And um, of course, um, by by that time, they, uh, there was no not much of Israel left, but the Judeans uh, took the name Israel. Um, at some point, those uh, Jewish traders arrived to uh, to the Black Sea, Slavic lands, um, and and crossed the Caucasus Mountains. They influenced a religious reform in the Kafka in, in the uh, Khazarian Empire. Uh, where the Khazar elites converted to Judaism. Um, many other people converted at the same time, including uh, uh, Slavs and, and, and other uh, people who wanted to take part of this Jewish trade. Um, at that time, they began using uh, Freydish, uh, the, the Slavic version uh, of Yiddish. Um, after Khazaria collapsed, uh, those Jews um, penetrated Europe uh, from from its uh, from the east, they moved west from the Khazarian Empire to Europe. The, after they arrived in Germany, um, they became began adapting uh, uh, Germanic words into their uh, Frey Yiddish language that they had that had that that had a, a Slavic base, Slavic grammar, um, and this is how Yiddish became to sound like German. Um, and, and eventually they reached um, Western Europe and the remaining part of Europe. Okay. Um, now, uh, the two hypotheses um, uh, um, count and classify the number of uh, uh, words in Yiddish and, and trace them back to their supposedly parental language in, in two different ways. The Rhineland hypothesis suggest that most of the words in Yiddish have Germanic bases with a little bit of Slavic and, and a tiny bit of Hebrew. Uh, the Slavo-Irano-Turkic hypothesis suggests that actually most of the words are from Slavic origin. The remaining are German or Germanoid. Um, that means sounds like German, but, but not really. And I can give you a contemporary word. Um, the word Ashkenazim, which is very common uh, commonly used, uh, it, it sounds like English, but it is not. There is no I N to mention plural in English. This is this is a Hebrew word uh, that is written in in an English way, and people use it as such. But this is very poor English. Um, if you want to say Ashkenaz in plural English, Ashkenazic or Ashkenazic, it's kind of it's kind of hurts. But that's the way it should be. Um, so so that's what it means. Um, uh, the Eid edition. Um, now, uh, another way of thinking of these two hypotheses is that the Rhineland hypothesis uh, suggests that if it sounds like a duck, then it's a duck, whereas the Slavic, Irano, uh, Turkic hypothesis says that uh, no, it may look like a fish, but actually you have to cut it and, and, and look at the internal organization. And just because it swims and, and looks like a fish, it, it's actually a, a completely different um, animal. And of course, every hypothesis has its own historical um, uh, description that it follows. It's already been presented very briefly. The uh, first hypothesis suggests a Germanic origin for the language, okay, some German dialect that became Yiddish. The other hypothesis suggests that um, Yiddish has been developed in the Khazarian Empire, relaxified during the time Jews lived in Kiev and Rus, and finally uh, got its final form in the Slovian area in Europe. Now, if you take 10 random linguists um, and, and put them in a room and ask them, um, if you follow the Rhineland hypothesis, go to this side of the room, and if you follow the 
believe in the other hypothesis, go to the other side of the room, maybe nine of them would go to the uh, first wall, and perhaps one would go to the uh, uh, other side of the room, and, and very likely because they misunderstood the question. Um, so um, that's that's the state of um, acceptance of these two hypotheses. Uh, Rhineland has been adopted by uh, people who also believe Jews have Levantine origin, whereas the slavo irano turkic hypothesis championed by uh, Paul Wexler, um, professor in Tel Aviv University, um, and, uh, and, and possibly a few others linguists um, who um, adopted this, this, um, this hypothesis. Now, the main challenges uh, uh, for any hypothesis is to answer uh, the following three questions. What is the meaning of the name Ashkenaz? Okay, it's, it's a long word. Um, it, it is not associated with any known uh, toponym, so place name. So how did it come about? How did Ashkenazic Jews become affiliated with that name Ashkenaz? Uh, why did Yiddish appear in the ninth century? And how can we explain the large presence of uh, Jews in Eastern Europe in the 19th century? The rationale of our study uh, is as follows. Um, if we um, assume that the history of Yiddish mirrors the history of Yiddish speakers, uh, we should be able to uh, take uh, the DNA of Yiddish speakers, um, run it through the geographic population structure GPS algorithm that we developed in a previous um, uh, study, uh, GPS converts DNA data into geography, uh, geographical regions, and uh, wherever GPS would predict those Yiddish speakers to, that would be the place where the um, Yiddish speakers' genomes has been uh, 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 finalized, um, received their genetic final genetic touch, um, and that would also be the uh, birthplace of Yiddish. Um, that's that's um, easy, uh, easily said than done. Um, where would we find the DNA of Yiddish speakers, um, solely Yiddish speakers? That's that, that's a big challenge. Um, or so I thought until I remembered that I designed the uh, database of the genographic part of, of the National Geographic. And when we designed this database, we um, um, allowed people to uh, um, annotate their genome and um, and tell us where their parents are from and what language or languages they speak. Fortunately, by the time uh, the uh, Yiddish study took place, already um, over a quarter million public participants um, agreed to uh, participated in the genographic uh, project. They already submitted their DNA data. They filled the annotations. We have a very large database to at our disposal, um, and and remarkably, four percent of public participants were Jews. Um, most of them were Ashkenazic Jews. Um, that, that was a, a, a it's twice their population size, but. Uh, based on the number of inquiries I'm getting, I would guess they're like 60% of the participants are Jews, but uh, you know, 4% were good enough for us. Uh, we had 367 uh, Ashkenazic Jews um, who reported that both their parents were Ashkenazic Jews, and we were able to split them into two um, almost even groups. The first one, we call them solely Yiddish speakers. These are people who told us that both their parents speak only Yiddish. Uh, this was really great for us because um, um, that would suggest that if those parents speak only Yiddish, that's because their parents or the grandparents of the users um, would only speak Yiddish, right? A and so on and so forth. So presumably that would be more homogeneous groups, whereas the, the other half of the Ashkenazi Jews, um, their parents spoke um, um, multi, uh, multiple languages. Um, so we expected this group to be more heterogeneous. Um, so how does GPS work? Um, well, it starts with um, selecting ancestry informative markers. Uh, so these are a special group of genetic mutation in the genome that have a very strong geographical affinity. So the uh, mutation that you see on the screen right now, as you can see, the A allele only exists in Southeast Asia. Um, so this is this is pretty good because if you come to us and you're saying, hey, I have this A allele in that particular marker, um, we can predict that you're from Southeast Asia and, and will never be wrong. Uh, presumably these uh, populations shown here represent the 
uh, the remaining populations. Um, so this is a very powerful mutation. And if you have a lot of those, such as 100,000 or so, um, then, then you can make very accurate biogeographical predictions um, um, with, with, with any population that, that you have. Um, so um, having this group of SNPs, and we published this in the GenoChip, it's uh, the name of the chip I designed for the GenoGraphic project. Um, this is when those uh, markers were first identified and, and recorded. The next step. Um, in the next step, we genotyped um, on the genotypes 645 individuals from, from all over the world, and we ran admixture analysis on them with various number of splits. So in this analysis, we're telling the tool, assume that once, long time ago, there existed 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, populations that were unmixed, um, and assume that they came about, and, and we want you to split the ancestry of modern day populations according to these hypothetical ancestors. So this is just a model. We don't think this story is true. We don't think such events happen. We just think it's a very useful model to capture the biodiversity of human populations. Um, and as you can see, this tool made all those splits. And of those, we selected uh, nine splits because they corresponded with what we know of history of, uh, of these uh, studied populations. Um, and we took those um, putative ancestral populations that admixture uh, um, created for us, and we simulated uh, putative individuals. So, so now we have um, individuals that would be the ancestors, hypothetical ancestors of, of modern humans from nine geographical regions. Uh, the next step, um, we ask for our modern day populations from which uh, gene pools uh, uh, your genome come from, and um, and we summarize the results in these bars. Every bar is one individual, and the different in colors represent a different proportion of gene pools for every individual. And what you see here is is very interesting results. You can see that everyone are mixed, which is great because we didn't want to replace one bad racial model with with another. Um, you can see that the gene pools are very well localized. So, for example, Africans um, all have the two African, uh, South African, and Sub Saharan African, the purple and the, uh, the red gene pools, and we almost don't see them outside of Africa. Likewise, uh, the Native Americans, so the yellow component, we don't, we don't see it very much outside of Africa, just a tiny bit in Russians, which would be expected um, from the shared uh, history, but not outside of it. So this is really this this is this this is a really good um, a, a, a result. But the most important one was that adjacent populations showed similar admixture proportion, and and that's very encouraging because we didn't have all the world populations represented in this panel. Um, however, having um, neighboring populations showing similar trends suggests that we can potentially make predictions into for populations that we do not have, as long as we have. Uh, uh, their surrounding populations. Uh, so how do we move from these to make biogeographical predictions? Well, we take the mean um, admixture signature of every population and we place it on the map like this. Okay, it's the same exact representation as before, except now it's in a pie chart, before it was in a bar. And there comes the individuals that ask us, where am I from? Um, so we have a nine numbers vector, uh, proportions, sums to one, and, and we have the same exact uh, uh, proportions for all those pie charts. And the next thing we're going to do, we're going to calculate the Euclidean distance between these individuals and the remaining uh, reference populations. And we can rank these, uh, uh, um, this by genetic similarity. So if you're more similar, um, you will be in, uh, in, in red. And if you're less similar, you're going to be in blue. And next thing, the GPS algorithm will kick in. And what the GPS algorithm will do um, is that the reference populations will start pulling this individual in their direction in a strength proportional to the, uh, to the genetic distances until a consensus is reached, which is when this sample will stop moving. And this would be the place where this sample was found. Okay. So this is why I call it uh, geographic population structure. It was kind of reminding us the, uh, the satellite navigation system that we need to maneuver our, our car and uh, we, we have there's satellites that talk to each other and, and get an idea of where the car is um, and so forth. 
Um, so how accurate is GPS? Well, it, it's very accurate. It's the most accurate biogeographical tool um, that, that has been published. Um, continental accuracy, 100%. Country accuracy, 83%. Regional accuracy, 66%. And then, of course, we show we can uh, we, we we can map uh, people to their correct villages uh, with very high accuracy. Quarter of them to the right to the you know to the village uh, front porch, uh, and uh, half of them 15 kilometers, and then most of them 100 kilometers. Um, compared to alternative tool tools, uh, those were very high performances. Um, so uh, GPS was the tool we chose to um, map. To, to convert the DNA of Ashkenazi Jews into uh, geographical coordinates. Um, so that was part of a paper that was uh, published in 2014 in um, Nature Communications uh, with a highlight in science, and uh, it was it was very well received. Um, so so back to our work about um, Ashkenazi Jews. Um, so this is what the uh, uh, um, the admixture plot looks like, so you already know what it means. Every bar is individual, so you can see the Yiddish speakers um, in, in the middle, and around them are all the populations that we could master from the um, relevant regions. Um, before we uh, will apply GPS to Ashkenazi Jews, we just wanted to test the accuracy for Eurasians. There were more populations here than in the previous paper, um, and it was a good practice to see um, just, just again, how accurate GPS is. So what we have here are Eurasians, non-Jews, um, and um, and we map, we apply GPS to these populations, of course, without them being present uh, in the reference panel, um, and and we ask how accurate the predictions are in relation to the political boundaries of their modern-day countries. Of course, I uh, was not happy with that. Um, estimation of accuracy. Political boundaries are results of uh, war and 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 uh, and political processes that have nothing to do with, with genetics. But we have to make uh, some decisions about that, and there won't be any good decision. But it's just worth to remember that when we miss a little bit the, bo the borders, uh, th there may be a genetic reason for that. Some because the algorithm is inaccurate. Um, so 95% of the people were, present, were uh, 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 localized 500 kilometers uh, from their borders of their modern day countries, um, 82% within 200 kilometers. So that was the average of all these Eurasian populations. Uh, the good news was that the results were much better for populations who spoke uh, languages that were very well localized. And that makes sense. If you only speak language that is not spoken outside of your country, it will be very difficult for you to get uh, dates, you know, with, with, with other people outside of your uh, um, language group. Um, so we can expect um, those populations to be more homogeneous. And that's good news for our Yiddish speakers uh, because their language is also very well localized. Um, applying GPS to Ashkenazi Jews resulted in the, um, in, in the following uh, figure. The Yiddish speakers are in uh, uh, orange triangles. Uh, we had some people who said they're Kohens and Levites. They're shown here, and then a bit of a few mountain Jews and Iranian Jews are also on the map. Uh, and the results pointed to northeastern Turkey, a region of no particular significance in uh, in Jewish history, um, not at all what was predicted by either theory. Uh, that's very baffling for us. Um, so we. Um, we uh, packed some uh, warm clothes and, and, and hiking shoes and, and food for several days, and, and we went to the nearby library, and we lived there until, um, until we found the following. Uh, we found that this region um, harbored uh, primeval villages whose name uh, most likely derived from the word Ashkenaz. So we have Ishkenaz, Ashkenaz, um, Ashkenaz, and Ashkuz. Uh, the last one was... Um, evacuated in the mid seventh century AD. Um, and, uh, s and and these are the first and only toponyms um, of the word Ashkenaz uh, known to us. And there are four of them, all of the f all in the same region. Um, and all of them are where Ashkenazi Jews were predicted to. And not only that, you can see that Ashkenazi Jews were predicted to a hub of trade routes. 
um, that, that are found in these very uh, important regions that borders the sea. Now the city, uh, the closest city that we have there is called Trebzond, uh, and it was a port city that in ancient time had banks and, and bazaars and, and very strategic region to do trade with, with the northern regions. So whoever uh, controlled the trade in this area uh, um, would be not only portable, uh, because they had both access to sea and the land, but uh, also very successful merchant, um, which made sense to us because Ashkenazi Jews were merchants. Um, and from, from ancient time, in, in the 8th century, they were Jewish and merchants were, were synonymous. Um, and traveling along the Silk Route um, or, or other trade routes moving between East and West uh, was something that has been, um, uh, Rabbi Novich already reported that, uh, it's been known for a while. Now, uh, this is the same figure, except I added here the uh, circles that represent where the parents of the people who participated in the study w were born. Uh, uh, circles are proportional to the number of people. Now, what you see here is that none of the people who told us where their parents were born were predicted to those places, um, which is surprising because uh, this is not GPS being off. We already shown that GPS makes very accurate predictions for um, European non-Jews. If those people were Europeans, they would be predicted to where the circles show us. What these results tell us is that this particular cohort of Ashkenazi Jews never mixed with the European people um, in, in, in the places where they arrived to. They always married other uh, their Ashkenazi Jews or other migrants from the same region, um, and they preserved their Turkish-like genetic signature. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking, I, I'm saying Turkish here just for simplicity. Of course, by that time, there were no Turks, not, not in those regions. I mean, is this clear, right? I mean, all, all people's names should be taken to an, uh, in, in the simple manner, not in the necessarily historical one. Um, and, and then we have one um, ancient Scythian there, and that's the, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the square, it's, uh, it's ancient Scythian. Um, looking at the haplogroups, both maternal and paternals, uh, they're very heterogeneous, so um, you can forget all about the uh, single ancestor um, hypothesis that a lot of people preach. I mean, it's you can see it's not in the cards. Um, what is uh, more interesting than this hypothesis is that the um, Yiddish, solely Yiddish speakers, show diff slightly different trends from the uh, the multilingual Ashkenazi Jews, as in they retained um, haplogroups of uh, East Asian origins. So in the Y group, that would be the Q1b. In the mitochondria, that would be uh, such haplogroups such as P2. So these are East Asian origins, and they were lost in the multilingual Ashkenazi Jews, uh, presumably because um, just just drift over time uh, made them disappear. Okay, so as we suspect that the solely Yiddish speakers uh, were more homogeneous groups and were able to preserve more more ancient signatures. Um, so, but how do we know that uh, GPS did not place Ashkenazi Jews in, in Turkey because they're half Levantines and half Russians, for example? Um, so to answer this question, we did some simulation. So we used the model that you see on, on the left top part. That's, that's the model. That's the distribution of the gene pools um, in, in Eurasia. From this model, we can generate individuals that would be native to to every region uh, according to the model okay so we generated some we call them khazarian kafkazian we generate some ashkenazic turks so from the model we generate people that would be native to those regions and you can see in c the places that we selected um, uh, to generate those uh, those um, archaic individuals um, in D, you can see where GPS predicted them too. Um, so um, if you're from, um, so, so the uh, um, simulated Levantines were all predicted to the Levant, but the simulated Iranians, only half of them, uh, le less than half, were predicted to Iran, and uh, some were predicted to Turkey, and some were predicted elsewhere. Why? Because the Iranians were very, very heterogeneous, and this entire region does not have very good uh, strong geographic signature. 
uh, related to genetics. So Iranians are a bit all over the place. Why is that important? Because that would um, tell us just how reliable those findings are. Um, in uh, pink, in, in B, you can see that the Ashkenazic Jews were all predicted to uh, fertility. Okay. Um, now in E, what you see is the genetic similarity between Ashkenazic Jews and, and everyone else. So Ashkenazic Jews are uh, uh, quite homogeneous. You see the genetic distance within this group is close to zero. But the next population they're closest to are the Khazarian Kafkazians, which is not surprising because if you look at C, there is a bit of overlap. Some of those Khazars are, uh, were sampled from Turkey. These are the boundaries of, used to be the boundaries of, of the empire. Um, and followed by high genetic similarity, the Ashkenazic Turks, which are predicted very well to Turkey from the model. In other words, if Ashkenazic Jews were half Levantines and half uh, Russians, they would not show high similarity to these populations. Okay, so from those results, um, we we know that the Ashkenazic Jews were predicted to Turkey because they look very much like model native, uh, 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 you know, ancient Turks, um, uh, rather than a mixture of two uh, or more different populations. Um, in F, you can see the proportion. Um, of uh, different clusters within our database and their similarity to uh, um, to uh, all these simulated individuals. So most of the Ashkenazic Jews show high similarity to the um, uh, Khazarian Kafkazians, um, and, and the Turks look like um, uh, look like the uh, the Turkish northeastern Turkish ones. Uh, what does it all tell us? Uh, well, uh, we um, remind you our goal was to address the question of origin of Ashkenazi Jews and their language, uh, which have been uh, some of the most debated language uh, questions in genetics history and, uh, and, and linguistics of, uh, over the past 300 years. Genetics, of course, a little bit less. Um, and just a reminder, the main challenges for any hypothesis was to are to explain the meaning of the word uh, Ashkenaz, um, the appearance of Yiddish in the 9th century, and the large presence of um, Jews in Eastern Europe in the 19th century. Um, Ashkenaz is mentioned in the Bible in, in three contexts, twice uh, in the context of uh, Noah's grandson, and, and the third one as the prophecy that Jeremiah uh, provides, uh, whereas one day the three kingdoms, um, Ashkenaz, Ninai, and, uh, and, and Aratru, uh, would, uh, uh, Ararat, sorry, uh, Uratru, um, would wage war on, on Babylon. They didn't really like the Babylonians for obvious reasons, uh, but that kind of gives us a sense of where Ashkenaz can be. Uh, um, and, and it's not in Germany, because they uh, it, it would not make any sense. Um, it should be somewhere in this region. Um, Ashkenaz um, is the, uh, uh, in, in Akkadian, is Ashkuz or Ishkuza, and, and it refers to the people that who the Greek called the Scythians. Um, and, and this is their location. Um, in, in the orange part, Babylon resided in, in Parthia and, and south. Um, so, so you can see why this prophecy makes sense geographically. Our predictions uh, were a bit, uh, um, you know, in northeastern Turkey, so just the edge of the uh, Scythian Empire. But this entire region was called um, Ashkenaz and Presumably, these these names uh, over time was was lost. Um, there is um, there is I don't need to tell you there is a process of changing certain names to other names to support um, uh, the, the, the 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 ambitious of whoever lives there in, in Israel. Uh, it's being done all the time and possibly in Turkey as well. Um, so names disappearing, ancient names disappearing. So we're for very fortunate to recover these ones uh, thanks to our um, GPS telling us where to look for. Um, um, so, um, so how did Ashkenazi Jews um, uh, became uh, affiliated with this name? So this question is not clear, but um, we already know that this name has been called Ashkenaz for a very long time, and we know that Jews uh, were uh, traitors. Uh, by the first century, most of the Jews in the world resided in the Iranian Empire, um, they were descendants from Judean uh, emigrants, or most likely from local converts to Judaism, which were extremely active in international trade. Um, over time, many of them moved north to the Khazarian Empire to expand their uh, uh, commercial operations. Uh, later on, they influenced 
uh, the religion reform in the Khazarian Empire, where the Khazarian Empire is converted to Judaism. There is no doubt about that. Um, consequently, not only the Turkish rulers converted to Judaism, but a lot of other uh, Eastern Slavs and, and other members of the empire, of the elite, converted to Judaism, so they can participate in the very profitable uh, trade between uh, between uh, Europe and, and China. Uh, that was a Jewish monopoly. Um, and we speculate that Yiddish emerged at that time as a secret language to give Jews advantage in trade, um, and it was based on Slavic and Iranian patterns. Now, anyone who speaks foreign language and, and shops in, 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 in uh, a source that were, uh, the, there is another prevalent language sp spoken, can understand the advantages we're talking about. I mean, you can um, you can manipulate prices. You can ask the guy, uh, you know, your worker, how much does this cost, and then set the person twice that price. Um, and uh, you either suffered or benefited from this phenomenon. But but hopefully you know what I mean. Um, but this this raises the questions. Provided Ashkenazi Jews are named after Scythians, the question is, are they Scythian? Uh, we believe that the answer is no. Um, Although in this study we did not use ancient DNA from Scythian, it is available now, so that question would need to be revisited. But for the time being, um, we believe that the answer is no, uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, um, um, we, we are not certain about the exact ancestry uh, uh, of the ancestors of um, Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, as said before, it's a bit difficult without ancient DNA, and it's only uh, just now. Uh, being published. Um, nonetheless, the term Ashkenazi is already a very large clue as to the Iranian origin of the group that inhabited the Central Eurasian steppes. Um, at that time, there were also uh, Greeks there and Slavs, so this was quite a, quite a hub of, of people of Irano, Greco Roman, Slavic um, origin. Um, but uh, so, so, why did they call themselves Scythians? Well, um, they're um, at, at, at that time, um, Scythians um, uh, were not there anymore, uh, but, but their memories remained. Uh, their language was not speak, uh, spoken at that time. It, it disappeared, but um, the, the, the name remained. And, um, and, and the annotation of, of the Bible gave it a very uh, 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 a certain glory, uh, not to mention the Scythians were very... Um, uh, uh, fearsome uh, warriors. Uh, the Greeks were absolutely fascinated with them, the story of the Amazon and so forth. And, and you always call yourselves after, after a higher and, and stronger culture. That's why uh, the Judeans call themselves Israelites. That this was a two different kingdom, right? And, and Israel was gone. The, 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 they were exiles. The ten tribes were exiled and the, the remaining sort of lost their identity. The Judeans uh, adopted uh, uh, those uh, th those people who remained and their Israelite identity, and we called ourselves Israelites, um, even though we're not really consider ourselves related to the large that large collective, but rather to the uh, Judean tribe. Um, likewise, um, these people in uh, ancient Ashkenaz lands. Um, they lived in a region that was called Ashkenaz. They had the villages whose name derived from Ashkenaz. Um, and there were those um, very cool people who, who were called also um, Ashkuza. Um, so they adopted the name at least for, for, for a while. Um, and, and potentially they also saw themselves sharing ancestry with those, with those people. Now, what happened to that name, to this identity, Ashkenaz identity, after they left? Uh, that's 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 a very fascinating question. Um, so why, uh, when, and why was Yiddish invented? So um, again, um, because there were so many Jewish communities along major trade routes um, who share religion, common culture, and history, um, they developed Yiddish as a secret language so they can maintain their political and spiritual unity um, and and gain uh, advantage in trade. This uh, conclusion is supported by two uh, a form of evidence. The first one is linguistic. There are 250 words of buying and selling in Yiddish. So this is the language of traders. And, and you can see just how many there is in English. Uh, the second one is the genetic evidence. We can see the genome of Ashkenazi Jews as being mapped to this hub of trade routes 
um, in, in the region that we call the ancient Ashkenaz. Okay. Now, the reason they needed um, Yiddish and could not use Hebrew is because nobody could speak Hebrew at that time. They could pray, but it was not a spoken language, so it wasn't good. Um, so how do we explain the large presence of Jews in Eastern Europe in the 19th century? Well, um, at some point, uh, 11th to, uh, century to, to the 13th century, Khazaria lost its prominence and the Jewish monopoly on the silk roads um, ended. Uh, this process um, was, was uh, stimulated by, by several factors, invasion of the Rus, uh, the Black Death brought by rats from uh, Asia to Europe, and, and the Mongolian invasion, um, just it was a little bit too much to ask uh, the Khazars to, to uh, maintain uh, um, uh, themselves throughout all those disasters and the empire uh, fell apart. Jews moved west uh, to Ukrainian lands and from there they moved to uh, Germany where German trader, where the Jewish traders already established some kind of uh, towns. Um, the relification process of the language has, was abandoned. Um, Yiddish, uh, Slavic Yiddish, there were other Yiddish languages uh, that went extinct in different parts of the world. Slavic Yiddish is the only one that survived. It's called today just Yiddish. Um, and it became the first and only spoken and written language um, and started absorbing more and more German words on its Slavic grammar, which is why um, people call it uh, uh, um, jargon or broken German. Um, so, so, so again, why, why Ashkenazic Jews? Where, if, if Jews moved out of Ashkenaz, um, why haven't we heard about that term before, uh, um, early on? And if it was, could it have been that it was forgotten, but, um, but, but some memory remained? Um, so these are all fascinating questions. Um, but, and, and of course, there is a lot of uh, confusion involving it uh, um, the, and, and some people believe that the only real Ashkenazic Jews are Germans and other non-German Jews are should not be called Ashkenaz. Um, our findings um, suggest otherwise. Um, a lot of the confusion uh, concerning this hypothesis stems from the erroneous association of the term Ashkenaz with German uh, Germans or German lands in the 11th century. Um, the, from historical perspective, the, the word Ashkenaz starts with a stiffness in the uh, um, and and that term remained in the region. It was not the the, the Germanic association was made only very later on. Um, already in, uh, in the 10th century in Baghdad, it meant Slavic, um, so the meaning of the word changed a little bit. And only in the 11th century, it was uh, it, it got the word of German um, Yiddish speakers um, and so forth. However, already in the 10th century, Moroccan Kuwait philologists knew that Ashkenazi Jews descend from the Khazars and, uh, and German, um, meaning that they came from uh, Khazar Empire and spoke um, Yiddish. Um, so, so you can understand this, this confusion. Um, and, and a lot of, um, there are several other authors who recognize Ashkenaz as, uh, as, as, the regions of the Near East, uh, Kap some Caucasus Jews uh, are still known by um, Ashkenazic by their neighbors. This is not because they adopted the name from German Jews. They were the first Ashkenazic Jews, um, which also means that those um, Turkish Jews, again, those people from that region in northeastern Turkey who arrived in Khazaria and later on moved to Russia, um, and are the ancestors, most likely, of modern-day Russians, should also be uh, uh, properly called Ashkenazic Jews. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not uh, the German Jews who hold uh, a title to that term. Um, so, uh, of course, some people do not agree. Abtrud suggested in her response to our paper that Jewish immigrants in Europe uh, just transferred biblical names at random into regions where they settled. Um, this is uh, a ridiculous proposal um, for several reasons. First of all, uh, biblical names, th 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 there was not randomness involved in the process of, of uh, transferring biblical names into certain regions. 
um, the, it, it's, it only makes sense if the two names have similar sounds. Uh, Germany and Ashkenaz do not sound the same, and Germany was already known as Germana uh, or Germania in Iranian in the Iranian Talmud. Uh, it was associated with Noah's other grandson uh, Gomer. Uh, uh, so, um, so uh, name adoption uh, for name adoption to occur, the two names need to have kind of similar uh, sounds, like Sfarad and Spain. Uh, this is not the case here. Ashkenaz has very clear geographical affinity that no one doubts that it's in the Near East, um, and, um, and, 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 and that explanation that Apert proposed uh, is simply not necessary. Uh, Germany was also known by French scholars, uh, Jewish French scholars like the Radak as Almania, um, okay, after the Almani tribes. Um, and that name was also adopted by Arab scholars. Um, so the questionable interpretation of Rashi as Ashkenaz um, that is often being made here to sustain the uh, the association of Ashkenaz with Germany is simply incorrect. Radak uh, came after Rashi. He, he's, he's used his language, uh, his symbols. So obviously, he could read what Rashi wrote, and he would not make that mistake as in uh, ignoring what Rashi called Germany, supposedly Ashkenaz, and call it Almania instead. So. Um, this association associated with, with Rashi is simply incorrect. Rashi did not mean Ash Germany when he used the word Ashkenaz. Um, Yiddish is uh, a Slavic language. Uh, Paul Wexler's um, excellent book and, and our uh, study bring several uh, uh, cultural evidence to support this. Uh, two of them, known ones, are breaking glass in a wedding ceremony and placing stones on graves. Um, surely you've seen it if you're Jews or if you haven't Jews you didn't understand why there are rocks on graves but that's a Slavic Jewish practice uh, breaking a stone of course is very well um, known today as Jewish practice that's a Slavic origin um, now I, I uh, don't know how it is done in Slavic lands but uh, in, in Israel they're not using glass they're using some some very very thin form of, of, of glass and you can see it, it should be wrapped in uh, in, in some kind of napkin um, because uh, and, and every year there is this guy who uh, you know buy those cheap shoes and ends up in the hospital because or, or use real glass because they forgot that you know special uh, glass uh, <laughs> and so, so it's kind of risky practice uh, don't try it um, don't try it at home um, so uh, yeah these are uh, Yiddish practices um, so, so how do those results um, in re uh, in respect to the remaining literature? Well, oddly enough, um, they're in general agreement with uh, the findings of other studies, of course, not necessarily their conclusions. Uh, there is a very well-known bias in the field where um, you know, people feel that it is necessary to uh, f uh, show that um, Ashkenazic Jews are from uh, the Levant for obvious reasons. It has nothing to do with science. Um, but um, they were never able to show that convincingly, or else there wouldn't be so many studies trying to do so. The vast majority of genetic studies found that Ashkenazi Jews are very similar to um, either Near Eastern uh, populations or South European populations, Greeks, Italians, but, but never to uh, Bedouins and Palestinians, if you take into account other populations. Of course, if you only test Bedouins and Palestinians, and, and English, you would found that Jews are closer to the Levantine one than to the English ones, but and, and that's one way to bias these kind of studies. But if you use a wide array of populations, the the the, the first ones will come up uh, more similar than the Levantine ones. Um, of course, uh, with with very few exceptions, such findings uh, of Near Eastern and South Europeans are being interpreted, uh, or should I say, misinterpreted in favor of Middle Eastern Judean ancestry. Um, although the results do not support that. Um, then there are several ways of conjuring uh, Middle Eastern origin, despite of the findings, um, and I'll, uh, our paper has discussed them at, uh, at length here, just very briefly. Um, whatever uh, one way is that whatever you find, uh, let's say you find Southern Europe, such as Stelden and colleagues found, so that would be the Europeans one, right? Then you'd say, oh yes, it's consistent with the Med Mediterranean origin because you know uh, South Europe borders the Mediterranean, hence the connection to the Middle East. Hence, Jews are from the Middle East, which is anyone who would read the study understands as the Levant. The, the Middle East is a very large region. 
harbors the Levant, the Levant would just be Israel, maybe bits of Lebanon and Turkey. That would be the Levant. But when someone studies says we found Jews to the Middle East, the, the, the connection they want you to make in your head is that they mapped it to Israel, which is not the case. Um, another way of uh, reporting the results, like Rustid Al did, they declared that uh, it is part of the Near East. Um, so they, they map Jews to the Caucasus region, which they call the Near East, and, and instead of calling it Middle East, now it's the Near East, and, and apparently the Levant is part of the Middle East now, of the Near East, uh, and also the Ashkenazi Levite that they tested. Um, very common fallacy um, to, uh, th that is made is saying that Ashkenazic Jews are very, very similar to one another, hence they have a Middle Eastern origin. Uh, so Koppelman and colleagues did that, uh, for example, and um, I, hopefully you understand that one does not entail the other. Genetic similarity within a cohort does not is not automatically uh, linked to the Levant. I mean, Chinese are more similar to each other than other populations, but they're not from the Levant. So one does not uh, um, allow you to deduce the other one. Um, but but you can see um, how they're saying it. They're saying that because they share genetic similarity, um, they, they, it means that they also share a common Middle Eastern ancestry, although this has never been shown in their study. Um, and um, Tian and colleagues dismissed uh, very similar findings. Again, the Ashkenazic Jews are similar to one another um, and similar to uh, a Caucasus population. So it should have been the conclusion should have been that they share common ancestry with the Caucasus, uh, but Tian et al. decided that uh, Jews are uh, aliens and that uh, in their case, <laughs> the results do not mean that they have a, a non levantine geographical origins. Um, and what is very, very common to do is to, um, is to make the argument that you found similarity with non-Jews uh, that are not in the Levant because those people in the past were Jews. And that kind of argument uh, is, is the same one that is being made in religion. It cannot be refuted. If you decide that any similarity you find because Jews and non-Jews, it is because the non-Jews were actually Jews, um, there is no way to test that, but also no way to refute that. Um, and that's a very common argument to make, and it's not being made only with regarding to Turks in the Caucasus. You can see it with Latinos, and 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 essentially every population Ashkenazi Jews show similarity too, because they're a very heterogeneous population, and there is lots of uh, uh, coming in and mixing and so on and so forth. Uh, they are expected to show similarity to other populations, but rather than interpreting the data in that way, which is consistent with historical uh, uh, data that we have, it is being interpreted as the other guy is a Jew. He just doesn't know that, and that allows. Uh, a genetic testing company to make a lot of money. Um, so uh, such argument was made recently by Bihar and colleagues that traced Ashkenazic Jews to Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Turkey, but instead of um, interpreting the data such as Turkish origin, which which they should have, that was the logic of their analysis. Uh, they claimed that those people share a Levantine, where it says Middle Eastern in this context, that means Levantine. Um, origin with Jews, hence this is why Jews are in Turkey. So no matter no nowhere no matter where Jews are gonna be predicted, it's because the other guy is, is a Jew, he just doesn't know that. And we're going back to Levant. You you can understand it's a nonsense argument, but that's the one being made. Um at Simon and colleagues um also found that northern Italians show greatest uh, uh proximity to Ashkenazic Jews, followed by um other Italians and, and French, um which should have been interpreted as a non Semitic Mediterranean ancestry. Instead, they, they decided Ashkenazic Jews demonstrate a Middle Eastern ancestry based on absolutely nothing. Um, the uh, same uh, authors uh, also interpreted different patterns of genetic segments uh, that are IBD, um, so uh, very long stretches of genome, very similar to other populations, uh, but they explain the data in the demographic miracle rather than explain it as scientists should without using miracles. Um, so far, as far as I know, no large scale study has reported that Ashkenazi Jews are genetically closer to Germans or Israelite populations when compared with Near Eastern and Southern European populations. Um, and um, in our analysis, all biogeographical analysis, Bedouins and Palestinians are the only populations localized to Israel, uh, not Jews. Jews are from the Caucasus and the Syrian region as well. Um, so this paper was. Uh, 
received quite well. Uh, the number of readers in the first couple of weeks estimated in the millions. Um, this is the uh, unfortunately only third most read paper in genome biology and evolution. I, I find it quite hard to top uh, the first two that uh, one I read, one I wrote, and, and the other one is a highlight. Uh, the fifth one is has nothing to do with Ashkenazi Jews, but you're still welcome to read it. Um, and uh, and we're able to do some citizen science to to allow people to um, to uh, take part of uh, future research or or just. Um, if, if they want, or just um, use GPS to uh, study their own origins. Um, so I developed this tool for uh, DNA Diagnostic Center. It's called the GPS Origins. Um, it is much more advanced than the GPS I just presented in, in, in many ways. Uh, uh, for once, it has uses a um, much larger number of gene pools. So it allows to hone the signal, the ancestry signal, much better. Um, it uses a very large panel of reference populations, <coughs> so I think it, it, it's over 1,000 reference populations, and it doesn't yield a single point of origin like GPS does. It yields two, um, for sp roughly corresponding to two paternal uh, parental lines, and and each line also has some migration route, which is um, uh, how the DNA travel uh, along very uh, very. Uh, long time, of course. This is not a migration of a single person. This is how the DNA, um, where the DNA turned, as in uh, which populations it shows lesser similarity, uh, similarities. A and the full analysis will also give you the, the, the timestamps and, and events that led to this prediction. But these results that you see on the screens are for Russian Jew. Um, and interestingly, you can see the two lines converged in, in the region of ancient Ashkenaz and as they moved on together to Turkey. I, I, I felt it was quite a romanticized uh, result um, that, that this person got. Um, and, and of course, when, when you have such wide reception of, of a paper, it is unavoidable to have some criticism. Uh, two critical uh, opinion papers were published. Um, there were uh, we responded to the first one in very details, and 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 again the first and the second one, um, our response is summarized here. I'm not going to discuss their uh, criticism in detail. I don't think it is very interesting. None of them uh, discussed the major finding, which is the uh, primeval villages and and the link between genetics and geography, which we demonstrated. They just want to you know say that they don't agree with the results and, and they have the right to do so, but I have the right to ignore it. Uh, at least in this presentation, I, my, my de our detailed response is, is in those papers. Um, and I'm not gonna, uh, I don't want to waste time this reviewing it. What I would like to talk about a little bit is the second response that we provided. Um, not the response itself, but the added analysis that we did. Uh, the, the top figure shows you a, a summary of all biographical predictions ever made for Ashkenazi Jews. So it has the 2013, my 13 uh, paper, the Beharit al uh, results, and then the Daset al results. They were all made based on different data sets of Ashkenazi Jews using three different methods, and they all you can see they all converge in Turkey. Okay. I, I'm absolutely fascinated that my 2013 very limited biographical methods yield the same results as, as GPS. Uh, Behar's method is just off, um, but uh, as you can see, it is not in, in, in Israel. Um, and that, of course, did not is not what the authors reported. They just ignored their own results. Um, so, so this is a summary of, uh, of findings on... on uh, Biogeographical localization of Ashkenazi Jews. The figure below um, already was done at a time where ancient DNA data became uh, sufficient to allow further exploration um, of more ancient origins. And what you see here is a supervised admixture analysis where we ask um, for modern day populations to which ancient populations uh, do you most look like? Uh, so these um, uh, European hunter-gatherers and Anatolians, Levantines and Iranians, they're all ancient populations whose DNA was uh, sequenced from skeletons and mummies. Um, of course, they're all from different times. We didn't have the luxury with this limited data to 
uh, selected to reflect a particular time, so it has it is a bit limited. But nonetheless, you can see that when all things are equal, uh, Levantine populations show very high similarity to ancient Levantines, whereas Ashkenazi Jews show similarity to ancient Iranians. Uh, in agreement with our results above and the uh, findings from um, of the Das et al. paper that Ashkenazi Jews are of Iranian origin. Okay, so this is completely consistent with the ancient DNA evidence. Uh, and that paper also uh, did very well in uh, in frontiers. Um, two popular uh, popular science uh, articles that I wrote for the conversation um, also did very well. So there are about uh, 500 readers per day, um, and I think in my institution I'm ranked top 10. Uh, most read author. Um, and, and here too, with, with the rise of ancient DNA um, sciences and the progress made in this field by others and, and, and of course our group, we also wanted to allow some citizen science, allow people experience with the data and experiment with it. A different company called DNA Consultants um, uh, uh, agreed to develop uh, if the, the uh, to, to to make available the primeval DNA test that I developed. Um, so um, interestingly, we have ancient Israelites in, in the as one of the populations that uh, that people can test with. Um, so this is one uh, example of of results. There, there there are other screens I'm not showing here of a person who took the test. And that's the genetic similarity that they have with um, all these different skeletons that, uh, you know, we, we, we give them names to uh, make it more fun. And every skeleton has, has their own story. Um, and you can see that the eye similarities with ancient DNA, that uh, ancient person that we call uh, Gal. Um, and um, I, I believe she's a Neolithic female. Um, yes. Um, so, um, so to summarize, um, our study aimed to answer major questions regarding the term Ashkenaz, the origin of Ashkenaz Jews, and Yiddish, um, in light of two uh, prevailing hypotheses, the Rhineland hypothesis, the Iran of Slavic hypothesis. Um, our findings um, supported uh, the Iran of Slavic hypothesis. We found no evidence whatsoever for Levantine origin. Um, later analysis that we used ancient DNA um, sustained those findings. Um, in fact, uh, there is no evidence for Levantine origin in the literature. All we have are results being interpreted, or again misinterpreted, in favor of Middle Eastern origin, or most likely um, the, the the Near Eastern origins in the Caucasus and Turkey represented as uh, are being misinterpreted as being a midway between the Levant and, and Europe. Um, again, there is no evidence for this. This is just wishful thinking um, and, and a lot of bad science. I'm certainly not going to read the whole thing. It's all summarized in the paper below. Uh, but uh, those results um, produce um, a new history for Ashkenazi Jews, where the origin of the people was from uh, God-fearers communities that resided in the Black Sea. At some point, the, um, they fully converted to Judaism. The only difference between God-fearers and the Jews is circumcision. Um, they probably um, had one rabbi too many coming from Iran and, and beginning this process, with, with, which took a very long time uh, to, to be established, but uh, uh, making circumcision more, more prevalent than it used to be. Uh, there was a reason why they opposed uh, circumcision, uh, more than one, but that's a story for a different time. Um, and, and and after that, they moved on um, um, following um, uh, unpleasant events they experienced in Turkey. Uh, so there was, of course, the uh, the uh, Muslim invasion, and, and there was some climate change and, and other geopolitical changes that made Turkey uh, uh, um, not any, not desirable anymore. And they moved in two possible directions: one, the north, the northern uh, uh, direction to the Khazarian Empire, and the westward direction toward Italy. Um, uh, so that's uh, these are the conclusions of, of my study. You're very welcome to read uh, more of um, our academic.
academic work in my website. There are a lot of other popular science articles. Uh, this is my YouTube channel. Um, I'm also available on Twitter and my blog. Uh, thank you for watching.